we had a spike in the number of reports of smallpox. When we didn't search, we had the illusion that there was no disease. When we did search, we had the illusion that there was more disease. A surveillance system was necessary because what we needed was early detection, early response. So we searched and we searched and we found every case of smallpox in India. We had a reward. We raised the reward. We continued to increase the reward. We had a scorecard that we wrote on every house. And as we did that, the number of reported cases in the world dropped to zero. And in 1980, we declared the globe free of smallpox. It was the largest campaign in United Nations history until the Iraq War. 150,000 people from all over the world, doctors of every race, religion, culture, and nation, who fought side by side, brothers and sisters, with each other, not against each other, in a common cause to make the world better. But smallpox was the fourth disease that was intended for eradication. We failed three other times. We failed against malaria, yellow fever, and yaws. But soon, we may see polio eradicated. But the key to eradicating polio is early detection, early response. This may be the year we eradicate polio. That will make it the second disease in history. And David Heyman, who's watching this on the webcast, David, keep on going. We're close. We're down to four countries. I feel like Hank Aaron, Barry Bonds can replace me any time. Let's get another disease off the list of terrible things to worry about. I was just in India working on the polio program. The polio surveillance program is four million people going door to door. That is the surveillance system. But we need to have early detection, early response. Blindness, the same thing. The key to dis discovering blindness is doing epidemiological surveys and finding out the causes of blindness so you can mount the, pr the correct response. The SEVA Foundation was started by a group of alumni of the smallpox eradication program who having climbed the highest mountain, tasted the elixir of the success of eradicating a disease, wanted to do it again. And over the last 27 years, SEVA's programs in 15 countries have given back sight to more than two million blind people. SEVA got started because we wanted to apply these lessons of surveillance and epidemiology to something which nobody else was looking at as a public health issue, blindness, which heretofore had been thought of only as a clinical disease. In 1980, 1980 Steve Jobs gave me that computer, which is Apple number 12, and it's still in Kathmandu, and it's still working, and we ought to go get it and auction it off and make more money for SEVA. And we conducted the first Nepal survey ever done for health and the first nationwide blindness survey ever done, and we had astonishing results. Instead of finding out what we thought was the case, that blindness was caused mostly by glaucoma and trachoma, we were astounded to find out that blindness was caused instead by cataract. You can't cure or prevent what you don't know is there. In your TED packages, there's a DVD, Infinite Vision, about Dr. V and the Aravind Eye Hospital. I hope that you will take a look at it. Aravind, which started as a SEVA project, is now the world's largest and best eye hospital. This year, that one hospital will give back sight to more than 300,000 people in Tamil Nadu, India. Bird flu, I stand here as a representative of all terrible things. This might be the worst. The key to preventing or mitigating pandemic bird flu is early detection and rapid response. We will not have a vaccine or adequate supplies of an antiviral to combat bird flu if it occurs in the next three years. WHO stages the progress of a pandemic. We are now at stage three on the pandemic alert stage with just a little bit of human to human transmission, but no human to human to human sustained transmission. The moment WHO says we've moved to category four, 
This will not be like Katrina. The world as we know it will stop. There'll be no airplanes flying. Would you get in an airplane with 250 people you didn't know coughing and sneezing when you knew that some of them might carry a disease that could kill you for which you had no antivirals or vaccine? I did a study of the top epidemiologists in the world in October. I asked them, these are all fluologists and specialists in influenza, and I asked them the questions you'd like to ask them. What do you think the likelihood is that there'll be a pandemic? If it happens, how bad do you think it'll be? 15% said they thought there'd be a pandemic within three years. But much worse than that, 90% said they thought there'd be a pandemic within your children or your grandchildren's lifetime. And they thought that if there was a pandemic, a billion people would get sick. As many as 165 million people would die. There would be a global recession and depression as our just-in-time inventory system and the tight rubber band of globalization broke and the cost to our economy of one to three trillion dollars would be far worse for everyone than merely a hundred million people dying because so many more people would lose their job and their health care benefits that the consequences are almost unthinkable. And it's getting worse because travel is getting so much better. Let me show you a simulation of what a pandemic looks like so we know what we're talking about. Let's assume, for example, that the first case occurs in South Asia. It initially goes quite slowly. You get two or three discrete locations. Then there'll be secondary outbreaks and the disease will spread from country to country so fast that you won't know what hit you. Within three weeks, it will be everywhere in the world. Now, if we had an undo button, and we could go back and isolate it and grab it when it first started, if we could find it early, and we had early detection and early response, and we could put each one of those viruses in jail, that's the only way to deal with something like a pandemic. And let me show you why that is. We, we have a joke. This is an epidemic curve, and everyone in medicine, I think, ultimately gets to know what it is. But the joke is, an epidemiologist likes to arrive at an epidemic right here and ride to glory on the downhill curve. <laughs> but you don't get to do that usually. You usually arrive right about here. What we really want is to arrive right here so we can stop the epidemic. But you can't always do that. But there's an organization that has been able to find a way to learn when the first cases occur. And that is called GFIN. It's the Global Public Health Information Network. And that simulation that I showed you that you thought was bird flu, that was SARS. And SARS is the pandemic that did not occur. And it didn't occur because GFIN found the epidemic of pan, uh, the, the pandemic to be of SARS three months before WHO actually announced it. And because of that, we were able to stop the SARS pandemic. And I think we owe a great debt of gratitude to GFIN and to Ron St. John, who I hope is in the audience someplace, yes, over there, who's the founder of GFIN. <laughs> Hello, Ron. 